the seats at the front. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, a sad occasion, of course, but uh, thank you to all for those who have come such a long distance to join us today. Some of you have travelled many miles, I know. So, whilst we are here, this is good, I haven't got any light, I'm a man of a certain age. Um, whilst we are here for the sad passing of Harding, we are here to mourn, of course, but also to celebrate his life. The family said farewell to him earlier this morning, but we knew the venue of the crematorium would not have been large enough to have everyone there who would like to come and say their own farewells. So we're very grateful that the Guildhall allowed us to have the venue, which we can use as a little bit of a formal part to start with, and then uh, please feel free um, to stay on afterwards. Uh, there was a eulogy uh, read out this morning, and uh, if it's all right with those that have already heard it, I'll just um, repeat what was said. I'll tell you what I might need, someone to hold the torch. <laughs> It went really well in rehearsal. <laughs> A proud St. Ives man, Harding was born to parents James and Nora Leighty on the 18th of December 1934 in his maternal grandparents' home in Tallon Road in the town of St. Ives, where he was raised with his surviving younger brother, Norman. After completing his education at Hale Grammar School, Harding joined the Naval Reserves and from there began his national service on the ship HMS Warrior, an experience he fully embraced. Whilst on board, Harding demonstrated great initiative by purchasing eggs, which he then boiled and sold to his crewmates, making enough profit for him to put a down payment on the porthole, a gift shop in the Warren. Following DMOB, he returned to work in the family business before leaving to become manager of an estate agency in Penzance. From there, Harding set up his own successful business, Harding Leighty & Company, specialising in selling traditional St. Ives properties. As a young man, Harding was a considerable civic figure, serving nine years on St. Ives Borough Council, becoming an alderman, and then serving as the last mayor of the borough before it was relegated to a civil parish. When he first stood for the Borough Council, Harding declared that progress was coming to St Ives, whether we like it or not. And in an inspirational election address, he said, let us take advantage and pro progress in a St Ives manner. Remember that we hold this town in trust, not only for our children, but for our children's children and make our plans on a long-term basis. Harding went on to meet beloved Dee, a girl from London, who he married in October 1958, and with whom he celebrated the birth of three much-loved children, Jim, Joe, and Tammy, who have fond memories of being raised in Norway House, a property in the centre of town. With the passing of time, the children made their own way in life, and the family expanded to include sons-in-law Keith and Mark, grandchildren Kitty, Gavin, Lee, Daniel, Matthew and James, as well as great-grandchildren Ruby, Jack, Daisy, Alina, Jared, Regan and Lily, all of whom Harding thought the world. After a well-earned retirement, he continued to enjoy his life around Dan Long and about the harbour. A great conversationalist, Harding had a wealth of stories about old St. Dives and the characters he recalled from his youth. Latterly, he became a regular contributor of short, informative reminiscences in the St. Dives Times and Echo newspaper, which proved very popular. Perhaps amongst his many tributes to Harding, and one that encapsulates his character and influence, is from friend Dell, who has chosen words from a poem written by W.E. Henley, entitled, So Be My Passing. 
My task accomplished and the long day done. My wage is taken and in my heart some singing, some late lark singing. Let me be gathered to the west and the sundown splendid and serene death. And the epitaph from explorer Alexander Lane Smith. Something strong, genial, and immensely kind has gone from this world. And so we say farewell to Harding, a larger than life gentleman, with a true sense of his own worth, safe in the knowledge that he filled his niche, accomplished his task, and left the world a better place. So Dad said to me on his 60th birthday that it was a very sobering uh, time. He was aware that neither of his parents made 70, and he thought he may only have 10 years left. Well, he had, that was a long time ago, and he had many more years, of which he enjoyed. I don't need to tell you how much he loved the town and the surrounding area. Once during one property recession, there was no money to go on holiday, and he said to me, well, I don't need to leave Penwith ever again. Everything I want in the world is here. So um, whilst towards the end the body was failing him, uh, the mind remained really sharp. And the last few months were very much on his terms. At Easter, uh, he declined uh, major intervention in the hospital and told them to send him home. At home he had some amazing carers coming in, but of course he teased them mercilessly. With Joe and Tammy coming to see him every day, he was well looked after and was able to issue his directions so all his needs were met. Well, most of them. He did begrudge not being able to go to the kitchen and cook his own food. At Norway House, he was in a location where people could still come and chat. Many found him asleep in the chair, but he would claim he was just meditating. <laughs> Even when stuck in bed in the last couple of weeks in the dining room, he loved people to come in and see him. Although he did let him then know when he had enough. Of course, everyone asked how he was, and he would say, I'm fine. He even said that to the medical professionals. He wasn't fine all the time, but he didn't want to fuss. And it's the same with today. He didn't want a lot of fuss. His view was everyone should have a pint, a pasty, a cup of tea, a bit of saffron cake. And he would quietly slip away. Well, when I say quietly, it would probably be to the putt-putt of the diesel engine as he leaves the harbour and goes out into the bay one final time. This reminds me of school assemblies, except you're listening and the students didn't, so this is scary. Dad really was one of a kind. Life with him is fun. He loved his five o'clock club in the sloop. Well, I can see some of you here today, so well done for surviving that with him. <laughs> he perched on the stool in the front bar by the hatch. Tourists would come in with a chihuahua under their arm, and Dad would go, oh, I love your Alsatian. <laughs> see the numbers of say what's happened to them. His best line to locals, well, I know some of you have fallen for this, was, what's all this I hear about you then? <laughs> To which people would say, oh, I didn't realise it, it wasn't legal to do that. Or I didn't know she was married. But in fact, he knew nothing about you at all. And he would then spill the beans, giving him an opportunity to embellish the story, quite possibly. And then, of course, write to the Times and Echo. If he ever teased you, it was because he liked you. We used to joke that the reason Mum and Dad's marriage was so strong was because he went fishing March to October and she did operatic October to March. <laughs> but they really did have the most amazing relationship. 
They loved their travelling and they averaged about three holidays a year. Greece in May and October, as the oldest backpackers ever, ever around, and somewhere tropical for mum in the winter. Dad claimed that he kept the Greek economy going because he had 30 euros in a bank account in Telos. <laughs> Dad had a roguish sense of humour and a quick wit. A few months ago, he said to me, Joe, pass me that mirror. And I went, oh, okay, sweetheart, what do you need that for? He said, I just want to look at perfection. <laughs> As Jim says, he continued to tease his carers and bless them. I think some of them didn't really want to go in sometimes. But um, if any of them are here today, thank you so much to Cornwall Healthcare Services. You were amazing. When he was 60, we did a This Is Your Life book for him, and we asked friends, some of whom are here today, to give us a few stories. And as you can imagine, we got quite a few beauties. So I've just got two quick ones, really, to share with you. <coughs> Ted Feller wrote, When Dean Harding was staying with us in Hong Kong, on the Saturday morning, Harding and I went on the mooch through the street markets. Now this is an area of rich pickings for a great white bargain hunter like Hardy. Irresistible. Barrows and stalls of clothes, shoes, exotic smells and snake sellers, all amidst a bedlam of ceaseless chatter, ripe smells and quick changing dollars. A veritable Aladdin's cave for Hardy and we were soon in the thick of it. He wandered in and out picking over, haggling dollars, but all with that commercial acumen and savvy that only comes from decades of making it in the heady world of finance and property. We wandered into a cut price sports kiosk and we found real leather trainers, which we again haggled down to the giveaway price of seven pounds. We got home, we showed the girls our purchases. And as we were putting on our flash trainers, that Harding discovered that he had bought two red feet. <laughs> it collapsed in his stereo. <laughs> Another one was a poem written by Baz Searle, which I think sums that up beautifully. With gun and net, and pot and hook, and anecdotes and history book, plants and herbs and local ways, and memories of younger days, Life at sea, mayoral garb, and many jokes with just a barb. Harding, we love you as you are. And pleasure, well that's ours, tar. Lovely. Sorry, just to finish, I did ask this last night because I suddenly thought, hang on a minute, David Kerr's going to be here today and we just can't get away without acknowledging how wonderful Uncle David was to Dad. They really did have great away days. And David would pick Dad up, sort of ten, half ten, and they'd go down to the metropolis of St. Just. Because I think David chatted a lady up down there in the pub. But I'm not one to gossip, of course. Um, they would often go by the Gurners Head first, all the way down. Then they'd go to Sainsbury's um, for a pensioner's lunch. Um, and then often end up somewhere like Port Eleven. <laughs> David, Dad used to be in stitches telling me this, but he said, David sat in that cafe that afternoon and very loudly announced, we're from St. Ives, you know. <laughs> and Dad said, you could just feel the room divide. You know, you could sit there thinking, well, that ain't anything that I'd actually, you know, want to be saying about. But David, seriously, Dad really, really appreciated all you did for him and how much you looked after him. You took him to appointments and everything. And obviously, we look forward to hearing any stories that you have on Dad as well after this. Thank you. Before I start, I just want to say how fantastic it is to see so many of you here and how we've felt supported in the last months um, from your messages and bumping into you in the street in your cars. Um, Harding would have been very sorry to miss this, um, but I, as the sun is shining today, I'm sure he would have said something like, the sun always shines on the righteous. <laughs> and the ne'er do wells. <laughs> so I picked a couple of um, poems that Harding really liked and then some things he's written and I'd like to share those with you. And one of Harding's favourite things, poetry wise, was Arthur Caddock. He had a real soft spot for Arthur. Sorry, my throat is a bit sore so I'm a bit husky. Um, <clears throat> 
And uh, Arthur wrote this um, in uh, 1984 as Father's Day was coming up and shared it with Hardin. O oh, beautiful and splendid pa, what a wondrous man you are. A man devoid of any taint, the living version of a saint. You've passed your quiet and ordered days in simple and most seemly ways. Restrained your wife from going wild and taught her how to raise a child. Three times, and so your children are almost as perfect as their pa. <laughs> God bless you, pa, and God bless us. I think, I think we all agree. And so it's been mentioned sometimes that you might say something to Harding and you might run with it. Um, this was something that Trevor Corsa mentioned to Harding one day and Harding penned a small poem dedicated to Trevor with affection on having sneezed and put his back out. <laughs> it's very sad, a simple sneeze can bring a strong man to his knees. God forbid if he should cough He'd probably shoot his head right off. <laughs> and this one about Janet Penfold, um, who we did all miss. Janet Penfold had a strimmer for a play on a summer's day. It was given for her birthday by her daughter, so they say. The first time she tried it at Clodgy, it took off with a roar and whirled in expanding circles and then lifted her from the floor. That was all we saw of Janet, as as to the west she flew. Whatever happened to Janet, we never, never knew. <laughs> and as has been mentioned, David Kerr has been a very big influence over the years. Um, uh, some good and some bad, <laughs> but an influence all the same. And we're very grateful to him for all his help over the years with Mum and Dad. And Harding wrote this in 1991 when David still had the tinners. The duties of a landlord are more than you may think. They're more than bar benevolence or a sale of a drink. When selecting a good hostelry in which you've never been, the thing of great importance is to know the landlord's inn. So David, you must be there for seven days each week. Forget the dreams of freedom, for you are what they seek. He's an innocence among us, original as sin. He's the landlord of the tinner's arms and not the never in. <laughs> now occasionally Dad would pen something that wasn't from him and if he heard something about you or felt that something needed to be said, this was the best way of getting it across. Um, in this instance, um, Harding has pretended to be Tony Blair. <laughs> Hold your seat, Harry, my six. This is about you. A personal message from the desk of Tony Blair MP, Labour Party Conference, Blackpool, 4th of October, 1996. Dear Harry, many thanks for attending the conference which I very much appreciated. But touching on our care in the community project, would you, Harry, as a personal favour to me, repair Mrs. D. Lady's shower as soon as possible? <laughs> it seems she has mentioned to me that she's difficulty in letting that room. I look forward to you getting everything sorted in some times 
before the general election. <laughs> Yours sincerely, Tony. <laughs> we have a drawer full of things that Harden has written, and at some point, hopefully, we'll collate them and put them together. My goodness, he was naughty. <laughs> I don't have the uh, same skill as Harding did, but I wanted to write something, and uh, I thought about it. Thank goodness we had a month. But it came to me um, in the middle of the night and stole my sleep. <clears throat> it's called Late Night Thoughts. Did Harding ever tell you what he was cooking for dinner? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did he show you how to splice a, a rope or tie a knot? Yes. Did you move house, but your cat chose to move in with us? Did you go to the sloop and home again to find your handbag full of bottle tops and rubbish? <laughs> that was Harding. Did you get a mooring in the harbour when there were none to be had? Hello, new cousins. Did he leave fish or runner beans hanging on your front door? Did he sell you a home, a house you didn't know you even wanted? But he knew it was right for you. I have to tell you, he did that to me four times, and I loved them all. <laughs> that was hard on me. Were you welcome to share our home or eat at our table? Did you drink with him at five o'clock in the sloop? Did you walk with him to places not shown on modern maps? Did he ever tell you a story that wasn't quite true? Did he cook for you, sneak away from the dinner table, leaving you with Dee till the early hours while he slept soundly? <laughs> that was Harding. Did he say to you, what's all this? I've heard about you then. And in an instant, you were admitting to things, thinking he already knew. Did he burst into Cornish song and surprise you? Did he love your produce and let you know? Did he attend your exhibition, gallery opening and poetry night with a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye? Or did he make you a puppet for your theatre? Perhaps he helped you to raise funds for a local charity or danced you round the steeple. That was harder. Did he stand by you when others were less sure? Did he drink your home dry and eat the flowers off your uh, eat the heads off your flowers? Did he take you fishing in his boat? Did he sit on the town council with you and second your proposal? Did he make you laugh at Round Table 41 Club and the Cock Robin Choir? Did he encourage you to sell mackerel on the harbour front at age seven? <laughs> <laughs> that was Harding. Did you ask for his opinion and he listened, even though his hearing was awful? Did he share his passion for local history knowledge? Or did he make you believe that Paul's Minister Point was the only place in the country where you could catch breaded scampi. <laughs> <laughs> if he teased you endlessly, you were his friend, and that was Harding. Did you know he donated cup hooks to the sloop? But every time someone removed the one he used for his hat and latterly stick, he would replace it from one from his top pocket probably a hundred over the decades. Did his times and echo submissions make you smile? Did he tell you about his Navy days? Did he encourage you to try something new? Did he believe in you when you doubted your ability? Did you ever know him to be lost for words? Did he, he's one of we, and always will be, that was hard. So Harding didn't leave us any instructions for today. He sat in the chair and laughed and said, you'll sort it all, which we've done our best to do. 
But for the last 20 years, he's been um, writing or sending a poem out to people that was written by Nadine Stair. And he's got some advice for us all, of course, and I'd like to share that with you. I'd pick more daisies by Nadine Stair. If I had my life over again, I would try to make more mistakes. I would relax, I would loosen up, I would be sillier than I have on this trip, and I know of very few things that I would take seriously. I would take more chances, I would take more trips, I would attempt more mountains, more rivers, and watch more sunsets. I would burn more petrol, and I would eat more ice cream and fewer greens. I would have actual problems and less imaginary ones. You see, I'm one of those people who have lived steadily and sensibly, insanely, hour by hour, day after day. Oh, I've had my moments, but if I had my time over again, I'd have more of them. In fact, I'd have nothing else, just moments, one after another, instead of living so many years ahead of each day. I've been one of those people who take plasters and snake bite serum on a two hour walk. If I had to do it over again, I would go places and do things and travel lighter, more than I have. If I had my life over again, I would go barefoot and wear shorts earlier in the spring and stay that way till late autumn and of course go fishing every day. I would have played more truant as a boy. I would ride more merry-go-rounds. I would pick more daisies. Dad was all about the food, as a lot of people know. So hopefully we have some food arriving in the room in a moment. But just to say as well, thank you so much to Cousin Frank for setting up this fabulous slideshow today, and also to um, Alban for all he's done in preparing it, and also to Margaret for the flowers. Fantastic, thanks so much. So please, Mingle, we'd love to hear your stories. Um, hopefully you'll get something to eat and drink too. And um, we really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. One more thing I think Harding would have said 